করা যায় আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে তাহলে আমি ই করি শুরু করে দেই আমাদের আজকের স্পিকার হচ্ছেন সাব্বির সাব্বির পাবলিস ভাই ওনাকে আপনারা সবাই খুব ভালো করে চেনেন কাজেই ওনার কোনো ইন্ট্রোডাকশন দরকার হয় না তবু জাস্ট ফর ফর্মালিটিস হি হ্যাজ 35 ইয়ার্স এক্সপেরিয়েন্স ইন দ্য স্যাটেলাইট ইন্ডাস্ট্রি এন্ড কারেন্টলি হি ইজ দ্য সিইও অফ অ্যাস্ট্রোকম টেকনোলজিস a company working on developing more efficient rf transmission for satellites mr parvez is also a consultant for satellite design and operations his technical expertise includes guidance navigation control satellite systems design satellite mission operations launch support and orbital mechanics he has published uh, 20 papers in professional journals and conferences he holds two patents an autonomous orbit on autonomous orbit control system mr parvez's professional experience includes serving in various responsible positions for rca astro electronics lockheed martin gte spacenet i um, mean spacenet and orbital sciences corporation Mr. Parvez holds BS in mechanical engineering from from Michigan Tech and MS in aerospace engineering from Princeton University. He is an associate fellow of the AIAA, means American Institution of Astronauts and Ast I, I I forgot what it means, astronautics. Astronautics and aeronautics. Aeronautics, right. Mr. Parvez has been living in Virginia with his family for the last 32 years. an interesting footnote about his family is satellite design is a family business for him two of his sons and their spouses are also satellite engineers the third son is in gis using satellite technology with that it's my pleasure to present mr parvez to you thank you very much so akon uh, it worked last time first time so hopefully it works again i'm hitting the screen share yeah and here we go can you all see it yes all right so so basically the the reason i'm presenting this is you know in light of uh there is some renewed interest in satellite especially in context of bangladesh and so on even though i'm not really um, you know this talk is not geared to, towards any uh, uh particular issues of uh, the bangladesh satellite but nonetheless i thought that for people to understand and you know uh, to see what's going on it probably makes sense to have an idea of what basic satellites uh, satellites are all about uh, obviously it's a very um, broad subject so i kind of had to pick and choose and you know at what level to cover uh, but hopefully i'll do justice i mean we can have follow up sessions later on if there is continued interest in certain areas but for now I, i'm hoping that this will give you enough um a kind of overview of what we talk about when we are talking about satellites mm -hmm. all right page down all right so basically as you know satellites originally a moon is our satellite and so on but in our context we are talking about items that people are you know human beings have made are building that we send around to orbit the earth or other heavenly bodies that we have over the years so in a way essentially satellites are platforms that are orbiting the earth Uh, so once you have a platform then obviously the next issue is what can we use it for that can be useful to us that can make money and so on and so on and that's how you know people started thinking about what kind of payload can we have on the satellites payload as by definition you know it's something that pays off your investment in putting it up there and so uh and that's how you have a whole variety of that a communication satellite observation meteorological etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh and one analogy uh that i want i often use is think of a truck a 
trucks have different payloads. You have dump trucks, you have tow trucks, you have fuel trucks, you have, you know, there's a whole variety of that. And so each truck is defined by the payload that um, it has on it. Uh, and it's very similar on satellite. You know, the satellite is communication satellite because it has transponders it's, uh, and so on. And the other thing about going back to the truck is regardless of what the payload is, every truck has to have some basic functions, right? You have to have a motor, an engine to make it move. You have the steering wheel, you have the brakes, you have so-and-so. So similarly, satellites, you basically break it up into two components. One is called the bus and the other is payload. Bus is the one that provides the functionality required to accommodate the payload and provide the functions that we need for an orbital mission. So for example, if you look at, you know, I'm moving my arrows in there, we have to acquire and maintain the orbit. So for that, we have to have an onboard navigation system. We have to have a propulsion system. And propulsion system, basically you're talking about a tank full of propellant, usually hydrazine, that's the most common one. And we have a whole series of small thrusters and some big ones. Uh, they, they have, uh, then the next one is the pointing orientation. That's called the attitude control system. Uh, so just being in the right orbit is not enough. You have to make sure the satellite is pointing in the direction that uh, you need to point to. In case of communication satellites, you have to make sure that at every moment is pointing towards the earth. And I'll go into a little bit more details later on. Similarly, we have to provide the power to the payload. You have the power system. You have to you know, maintain the thermal balance. And finally, you have to provide the command and telemetry so that you can talk to the satellite and you can uh, get data down from there. And so just to make it look nice and interesting, I have a couple of photos in here. Uh, the middle one is uh, are typically what the communication satellite looks like uh, on when it's being built. Uh, on the sides, there are the panels which are folded, so, and this this uh, dish also is folded for launch, so it's put inside the capsule. But once it's up in the orbit, then the up picture up and the uh, the upper one shows you the solar arrays are you know unfolded, and you have the antennas in there, and this is pointing to the Earth. And on orbit, this is what a satellite um, communication satellite looks like. Uh, here's a picture of um, observation satellite. And, uh, the interesting thing is, this is more of a telescope kind of thing, you know, and it can have infra infrared. I forget which one I took this from, uh, but and you can see the solar arrays, which are also folded around it here. But once it's um, launched, then this also unfolds, and you have a rather flat uh, surface. And that you know, and solar arrays are the only source of power once they're up there. Now. Go to the next page. This is very important, which is, you know, what is it, what is special about space, about satellites in space? The first thing is, in fact, I'm going to start from the middle. There's no recall, there's no repair. Once you have launched something, that's it. So, which means the systems have to be very reliable. And so, there are two, a couple of things we need to do, we do. And one is that, uh, we have to have components that are uh, what we call space qualification or space qualified, which I'll talk a little later. And equally important is that we do not have a single point failure in the whole design. What that means is every component, every uh, line, um, the you know, con connector, every you know, what you call the harness, there is always a workaround. You know, if you need, say, three gyros, we'll put in there four. If you need one computer to run it, we'll have one or two or three. And depending on how much, you know, uh, how expensive and how uh, important the redundancy is, but th that is a very important thing. And so now coming back to uh, the need to survive in space, Satell uh, communication satellites typically last about 15 years. And so in that environment, you have to survive several things. One is the 
the launch environment, it's it really vibrates. You must have heard, you know, when you see a launch, uh, the the amount of acoustic noise and the vibration, and so on. So every uh, so the picture I have here in the lower one, this is a picture of the satellite that we have put on. This is a vibration table. So you put in there and then you really shake it. Uh, you know, there are some uh, limits that we put in depending on which launch vehicle we are going to use. We know the profile, the vibration and acoustic profile of every launch vehicle. And so depending on which launch vehicle we are going to send it on, we will have a, a vibration profile. It's both sign vibration and random and shock and everything else that you think of. And so that's number one. Number two is the uh, extreme heat and cold. Uh, when the satellite is up, uh, the side facing the sun becomes quite hot and the side opposite of the sun becomes quite cold. And so as it rotates around, this can change. So what we have to do is, here's a picture up here. This is, this is a huge, uh, basically a thermal vacuum, vacuum chamber. This is a satellite. And what we are doing here is we are putting this whole satellite into that. We'll, we're gonna seal this. We're gonna pump out the air, make it into a total vacuum. And then what we do is we raise the temperature. There is again a profile that we follow and raise it up there. So at the high, high temperature, we run the whole series of tests, test out every component, every you know, functionality. Then we bring it down, we make it very cold. Then we run the same tests, set of tests when it's at the cold and we cycle it several times to, uh, you know, so that's what, you know, that's the thermal cycling or thermal vac, uh, TVAC it's called. You know. So we have to go through those two. And finally the radiation. Now, I do not know, uh, I think all of us, we realize that life on Earth is possible because of the, because there's atmosphere which got captured uh, by, you know, by whatever reason when the Earth was formed. And so without an atmosphere, there would be no light, uh, no, no life rather. But I don't know how many of us have realized that there's another item that allows us to survive. And that is, there's a, something called Van Allen belt. I don't know if you, how many of you heard that. It is a covering of charged particles uh, somewhere around between 600 miles to about uh, 20,000 miles in that range. And this, uh, these particles came from the solar uh, uh, winds and so on uh, at the beginning of the Earth's formation and it got trapped by Earth's magnetic field. And so what this, you know, uh, belt does is it prevents the gamma rays and the x-rays and so on from hitting the earth. They kind of get um, uh, you know, uh, sort of reflected off or and sometimes you can see some phenomena. Uh, I don't know if you have seen the aurora borealis in the northern lights. That's what the phenomena is. Basically all the charged particles are taken, um, you know, deflected and taken somewhere else. So we survive. Uh, so, but when you go to the, onto the orbit, you are outside the Van Allen belt. So you need to survive the radiation. And so when, uh, so every component, uh, for example, a simple transmitter that might cost say a thousand dollar when you build it on the earth to same thing if you want to put it on space will cost about $50,000. And the reason is I just explained the, all the things that it has to go through. And, and also I need to back up a bit, you know, the, the test that I'm showing here, which are the full satellites, every component that we get from the vendors, all of them in turn have to go through their own cycle and so on. So it, it you know, so that's the reason why it's become very expensive. Uh, and, it, and this is what sets apart normal, you know, uh, component versus and something that you want or that you can put on space. So, and uh, so let's go to the next one. Okay, so one, one of the things that's important and will, and I want to define it here because we will refer to uh, some of these items uh, later on. Uh, and so for this, we'll have to remember the geometry that we might have taken many, many years ago 
uh, and some of you may never have used it after since, but uh, but none the same. So one of the thing is the semi, semi major axis. If you remember the uh, ellipse, ellipse is basically the you the, essentially this this length, the major axis, and and half of that is the semi major axis. In case of a circle, semi major axis becomes the radius. But we talk in terms of ellipse because most of the time even we cannot achieve perfect circles, so you will always have an uh, uh, And defining the, uh, this um, circular ellipse is the term called eccentricity. Again, you may remember it from your geometry days. Uh, for a perfect circular orbit, perfect circle, the eccentricity is zero. Uh, for elliptical orbit, it's between zero and one. If it's one, it's parabolic, and if it's more than one, it's hyperbolic. So. Uh, just remember the zero versus non-zero. That's the thing. Inclination. So inclination is referred to the orbital plane with in relationship to the equatorial plane. So this angle that you're seeing, that's called the inclination. So in other words, for for an orbit that's perfectly along the equatorial plane, the inclination is zero. If you have a polar orbit, the inclination is 90 and things in between. Now it's the semi major axis, and in case of circle, the radius that determines the orbital time period, which is how long it takes for a satellite to go around the Earth once. Uh, typical low Earth orbits, and most of the satellites are low Earth. You know, this is for whether it's uh, weather, scientific observation, uh, for mapping, and so on. They're anywhere from 600 to 1200 kilometers, and they go around the Earth once. Geosynchronous, on the other hand, so so this is the point. So now you keep raising the uh, semi-major axis or, you know, until a time comes, you raise it. Uh, when you reach this 42164, that's a magic number. It turns out that the orbital period is 24, 23 hours, 56 minutes. Basically, exactly the same, you know, same rotation speed of the Earth. And that's basically is a concept of geosynchronous orbit, which is so, you know, the, which is the basis of all our communication satellites. And just as a reminder, this was thought of by uh, Clark, I uh, forget his uh, first name, the uh, science fiction writer. He spent his lifetime living in Sri Lanka, Arthur Clark. Yeah, Arthur, C Arthur, Arthur C Clark. Clark. Yeah. And he came up with this in 1945, 46. This is long before there were any satellites so you can imagine the foresight and so on and vision some some people have but he he's the first one actually who thought of this whole concept of geostationary so you know so communication satellites use uh, geosynchronous orbit the inclination is zero and uh, and eccentricity is also zero it's not it, it cannot really achieve that but that's a, a separate conversation uh, and as I said, observation and scientific and everything else, they usually uh, uh, are in the Leo. Leo means low Earth orbit, geo means geosynchronous Earth orbit. So just to save time, we refer to those. And observation satellites are usually polar, about 28 degrees. Uh, this for another reason that you want the pl orbital plane to move at the same rate as the sun uh, and to make it sun synchronous. So that's uh, some details. So having defined that. Now, how do we get to the orbit? You, you have a target orbit to go, go through. And so, um, as you know, I got some pictures here, but they, these are on the right hand, uh, this one, just for reference, this is the uh, Saturn V that was used to send men to the moon. So size wise, that still is the biggest. Although these days the thrusters and all that, they're much more efficient. So the thrust level and so on of some of these are much, much bigger than uh, Saturn. But for uh, most common ones that you hear about are the Ariane 5, which is which launches about, I would say about 50% of all things. Uh, your Falcon 9, it's a new entry, but they've done quite well, you know. Uh, and then uh, we also use the Soyuz rockets, the Russian ones. There are also Chinese ones and other ones, but these are the three that usually launch, I would say about 85% of the all the communication satellites. No. Now, a couple of things that you 
you see that, but you may not think about it. So just geo launch. So what we do is we launch eastward. And if you think about it, so why is that? Um, that that's because even if you're not moving, just standing on the Earth's surface, we are already moving. We have a speed, a velocity of about in the in the inertial space, uh, roughly 15, 16 miles per minute. That's how fast we are actually moving, uh, you know, just by standing still on the Earth's surface. So when we launch eastward, then what we're doing is we are adding this 15, 16 um, miles per hour to the velocity that's being provided by the rockets. If you were launching the westward, then you'd be subtracting, so which makes no, no sense. So that's the reason why you'll find that for geosatellites, all the launches are due eastward. And in case of America, you know, Cape, uh, Florida is right here, you do that. Uh, the French Guiana, the Ariane is launched from somewhere around here, they launch eastward. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we launch into polar orbits, they're all launched for American ones. We launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base and they're launched southward over the water right here. So this is uh, important. The other thing is, remember for, for communication satellites, we want to be in the equatorial orbit because for, for it to be geosynchronous, it has to be in the orbit. Now, the, when you launch eastward from any location, the minimum inclination you can have is that latitude. So for example, when we launch from Florida, the minimum inclination is 28 degrees, which we have to remove before you can get to station. This removal, this change of orbital plane takes up a lot of energy. So that's the reason why people try to find a site that's as close to the equator as possible. Fra the French, for example, they have held on to their colony in French Guiana right here, which is about four degrees. So they save even more propellant because when they launch, the, their tra the, uh, transfer orbit inclination is four degrees and you have to remove just that. Uh, for American launches is 28 degrees. If you launch from Russia, you end up with a 50 degrees or so, but the Russian rocket, they, they offer to take, take that out and you don't have to use satellite propellant to do that. Now, the other thing is when you see a rocket flight, uh, you see the little red there I'm kind of circling around. That, that is essentially the, the powered rocket powered flight, that's it. So typically the rocket sends you up about 100 miles up. But the most important thing is that it gives you a velocity, tangential velocity, that velocity is sufficient so that this velocity determines how this, this height. So if, in fact, if you had put in more, you, you know, the orbit would have been higher. If you had put in less, they would have been lower. So you kind of do the calculation. And this orbit is the, the, up, the green one is the geosync. So the rocket sends you in an orbit that's about 100 miles on this side and about 19, 20,000 miles on this side, which is the geosync height. And so once you're separated and you do nothing else, the orbit you'll have is the yellow one, which would continue. I mean, I didn't continue that. So typically this is the orbit that you'd end up. And what we normally do is we make a measurement of this orbit over the next two days or so uh, to get an exact figure. Then we do some calculation of how, how long we need to fire the thrusters at this point in this direction so that now firing and giving velocity in this direction raises this part. So burn number one, we raise it, this purple one, we rest for another, you know, not rest, we measure it again for another day, then we do the second one, and finally we get to the almost geosync one. But, uh, uh, and every time you do the burn, here's the example, uh, this yellow, the we are changing the inclination. This is the equatorial plane, the green one, we start with yellow, and every time you burn, in addition to, changing this, we are also making plane change here. And eventually for the final burn, we get here and we are also in the equatorial plane. So there's a lot of work to be done by the satellite after it has separated 
from the rocket before we can finally get to the right orbit and eventually to the right location. Uh, so I just wanted to, I'll talk about just um, communication satellites primarily, but I just wanted to give an example uh, of why we use some other satellites and so on. Uh, so here, think of satellite imaging. So in this case, here's, uh, you know, uh, one of the missions that we have, we roughly have a 680 kilometer orbit, orbital period is 98 minutes, and the inclination is 98 degrees. So the idea is that you'll go up and down this, this uh, orbit and your camera is scanning the surface. And the interesting thing is as you go, you know, and come across in the meantime, the earth is rotated. So now you're covering another area. So I, I, the best I could do was kind of come up with this one. So as you see, you're going around and this is the width of the beam or the scanning device that you have. You have taken the picture and then you go around. Next time around, you can see the earth has moved underneath you. And you, so you keep on doing that. And until at some point you can do a calculation of how many rotations you need and you end up covering the whole earth and then you repeat. So, so basically what I'm trying to portray is that the mission dictates what orbit uh, is the most useful one. And we uh, try to uh, use the launch vehicle to get there and maintain that orbit and do our mission. And so now let's come to the communication satellites because as I said, these are the most common ones that people know about. And for, for, for most, most of us, this, is the, uh, this has been the uh, one that we have uh, used the ma maximum, not so much these days with the you know cellular technology and so on. But in past, if you had to talk to Bangladesh, you'd have used Intelsat satellites to do that. Uh, so coming back to, that, uh, to the basic uh, point, you essentially have a space-based receiving and transmitting radio. That's all it is. So you, it's a repeater. You send a signal up, it will. Um, amplify it and send it down. So, so essentially that's what it is. It, you receive the satellite RF signal, you uplink and it amplifies, changes the frequency and sends them back down. And as I explained, geostationary means satellite orbits the Earth at the same rate. So it appears fixed. And so the location of the satellite is the orbital location or slot, which I'll talk to a little bit more about that. And it also might be noted that uh, since the geostation satellite is some 20,000 miles above you, it can theoretically beam approximately to 40% of the Earth. So it, it is, in the footprint is actually quite wide, but normally what you do is, you know, if you cover a certain range, then you kind of shape the uh, antenna so that you don't waste uh, your energy sending it over places that you don't need. And so you, that's how the, you get the footprint. And so, typical geosynchronous orbit, you have, you have to maintain the orbit using the propulsion system. And so satellite locations are uh, essentially you're given a slot. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Say your, your satellite is say 100 degrees east long, longitude. So that's where you're supposed to stay. And you have to keep it there using propellant because of reasons, again, I'll cover it a little later. Uh, and so your position is 100 plus minus 0 0.5 degrees, both in latitude and longitude. The lifetime is defined by when you run out of propellant. You are using propellant to maintain the orbit, to keep it within the location. And once you're out of, out of that, you have to, uh, you, you know, your, your lifetime is over. The attitude control, we have to maintain the pointing of the satellite because it's so far away, 20,000 miles, slightest deviation and you're really, your beam is missing, the, missing your target by a lot. So our system is precise enough that we can actually maintain it within 0 0.01 degrees. Uh, that's, the, you know, that's very small. 
So while the satellite is going around the Earth, we have the solar arrays, which are rotating in the opposite direction. They are always pointing to the sun. And that's how you get the uh, power to the satellites. There are some periods when the Earth gets in the way and you have shadows, particularly around the equinox times. And at the time, you have to use the battery. That's why the power system is a combination of solar arrays and the battery onboard batteries. And the reason that we have a communication system satellite is so that we have the transponders. And the small ones, we have 20 or so, the large ones, uh, 120, you know, there are some which are about even 140 transponders. The frequency bands, I do cover them a little later, but typically it's C band, KU band is the most common ones. Recently, much, much higher frequency K band is there. And for reference, in a lot of you have interest in that, uh, the Bangladesh satellite has 30 transponders, of which two are very high power DTH. This is a lot like the dish network that you have that size. And the rest are, you know, 36 are distributed between C and KU band. And this is again, just for out of interest to show, uh, this is what the C band coverage of Bangladesh satellite looks like. So you have Bangladesh, you have India, you have some coverages in this area, and you have Indonesia, some Philippines and so on. And this is the KU bands. So um, this it's covering some ocean area here and India, Bangladesh and Borneo for some reason, I don't know why. And uh, we have Philippines. So uh, now this is not my expertise. So I don't know if Nasreen is here. She spent her lifetime in uh, Intelsat doing that. Uh, the, the reason I bring this up is to sh uh, make the point that satellite by itself is not doing you much. It's just a node. In other words, to, to make use of that, you do need to invest a whole lot of money to actually make use of a satellite. And so there are multiple ways of doing this. And I just picked it up from some uh, uh, from our handbook somewhere, but uh, as you can see, uh, essentially, if you want to send them information or, or, or data to, you have multiple stations, so you, from your uh, say central station, you can send it to all the different sides. Here, um, there, you know, you can re read that in there, I won't go, go through that. But so there, there's a whole var variation of how you can set up the uh, networks, uh, you may have seen the mobile, th this is very commonly used, the news gathering, the, it's called SNG, satellite news gathering, where something is happening, your truck shows up and your antenna goes up and you can uh, show what's going on. And uh, uh, this is also essentially from one TV station, you want to send it to other TV station. There are, you know, you can think of multiple use. I just showing this because this is the diagram that I, got hold of, that's why. Star Network is an, imp you know, when I, I was at uh, SpaceNet many, many years ago, we had a fleet of 10 satellites. And one of our big customers at the time was Kmart. And the way we did that was every Kmart store would have these VSATs on their rooftop. And from the central one, they would have the real time, the pricing, the inventory control and everything else. And uh, so that was considered a, a big deal at the time. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, but once again, the emphasis is that in order to use satellite, you do need to invest quite a bit on the network. Uh, you know, satellite by itself is not doing you much good. Um, C band has been the at the beginning. This is what everybody used, and the advantage of C band, particularly for our part of the world, is it's not impacted by rain. So you you don't have what's called rain fade but the, it's a lower frequency. So the you know, satellite dishes are much bigger. The KU band is the next you know, uh, a higher spectrum for communication satellites. The dishes are smaller. However, we do have uh, weather condition, condition can cause problems. But so that's why what the QB, KU band usually do is they use spot beams. In other words, it's concentrated higher power so that it's not impacted. And uh, you know, but it's not, as spread out as you can get with C band. K band is the next range and uh, new satellites use this uh, frequencies, uh, but, uh, but that's, 
that's all I have. Now comes the orbital slot. So, as I said, for geo, uh, you know, communication satellites, we need geostationary or geosynchronous orbit, which means we have no inclination, ideally zero inclination, you know, perfect and perfect circle. So, which means zero eccentricity, and we have a remember the number four to one six four kilometers. So that is the geosynchronous. So that if it's not moving, then that means that's um, kind of corresponding to a particular longitude. So usually, where do you want to put your satellite? You have to apply to ITU and America, you apply to FCC. And when you apply, you tell them all the details, what frequency, what power, and so on. And based on that, they have to make sure that there's no interference. So, you know, I, I do not know orbital satellite because the number has increased so much since I last uh, looked into that. But typically, you know, you're, you have a degree or two separation per satellite. You would not put two satellites of the same frequencies side by side and so on. So there's a lot of uh, coordination that goes in there. But, uh, you know, uh, and nominally, when you apply for that, there is no charge for uh, slot allocation. It's free, but it does cost lawyer time and it does cost, you know, take time and effort and all that to get through. And so a lot of people have turned that into a business opportunity. Uh, I remember back in what uh, back in uh, late 80s, there was something called Tonga set, you know, some American entrepreneurs, they got together with the government of Tonga and filed for several slots out with tongue for Tonga sat with the frequencies and Tonga never had satellites they in turn essentially uh, resold the spots to other users and uh, in the immediate context I think some of you may know that Intersputnik this Russian company that also did the same thing they had several slots and and for Bangamundi satellite instead of applying to ITU or uh, you know to get their own slot they just took the one from Intersputnik. Uh, I think they paid some $30 million or something like that. I, I mean, don't quote me on that, but uh, something in that region. Uh, so in this context, there are there have been a lot of questions raised and that's why I'm trying to preempt some of, you know, some of the questions that you already have. Uh, and which is, for example, there's some understanding that, well, if 90 degrees east is my, you know, Dhaka is 90 degrees east, therefore Bangladesh, essentially has a right to 90 degrees east. And I, I can tell you, I talked to a space lawyer many, many years ago. There is no such right. You apply and usually they try to give you the best one that is applicable. But also you have to remember, I mean, look at this. The, the, since because the satellite is that far off, you do have a wide band of coverage. In fact, you, know, you can uh, cover almost plus, plus minus 70 degrees either way. And if you think about it, the latitude of London is about 50 degrees, 57 degrees. And so geosatellite still reaches them. So, uh, you know, so it's really the separation between where you are versus where your satellite is, is okay for up to 50, 60 degrees actually. Uh, but for reference, Bangladesh, I think the satellite, the Bangladesh satellite is at 120, 119, and we're at 90. So it's about 30 degree separation. So this is just, you know, for reference, I have this picture of the geostationary arc. Uh, obviously, I don't want you to read them, but it just gives an idea of how congested the geo, geo arc is. It's very valuable. Now comes the uh, I know, coming back to the life of satellite. Uh, remember we talked about ideally circular orbit, zero eccentricity and so on, and you fixed, stay at a fixed orbital slot. But in reality, there's a lot of perturbing forces acting on the satellite to distort the orbit. Uh, one is the lunisolar gravity, which is, you know, you have the gra gravity of the sun, of the moon, and also to remember the, the, that Earth is not spheres. If, if it was a perfect sphere, then you'd have what we call a central force field. Everything you'd be pulled, the gravity would be, acceleration would be to the center. 
but that's not the case. It's you know because of the bulge and all that. So there are many harmonics with the in the gravitational um, mapping if you see that, and so that causes the s satellite to be kind of pulled in uh, in along the east-west direction. The and uh, so and the other thing is the eccentricity is also impacted by the solar pressure. It's small, but continuous uh, pressure, you know, so the sun rays falling on the uh, satellite solar arrays, it has the tendency to make, turn the circular orbit into an elliptical one. So, so between the Earth's gra gravitational field and that, we need to maintain, keep correcting the satellite in its its east west uh, locate uh, uh, what do you call it location. So here's an example. This particular satellite was at 105 degrees west, so which is 255 degrees east. Your requirement is to keep it. This is the station keeping box, plus minus point uh, point zero five degrees. Sorry, I, I forgot the zero in here. So you see that daily oscillation. That is because of the eccentricity. In other words, if you're not a perfect circle, then this is what will happen. If you're sitting on the earth and if you can see the, see the satellite, you'll see it going back and forth over a day. And this is primarily from the solar pressure that's causing the eccentricity to increase. And if you don't do anything, it keeps on increasing that. And the, this movement here, this is from the gravitational, uh, the, the traxiality, the you know, the Earth's gravitational force. So uh, you have to keep correcting this. And typically, depending on the location in some places worse than others, uh, we have to fire thrusters along the east-west direction. And this is called east-west station keeping. Uh, anywhere from a week to two weeks in that period, we are continuously doing that. You measure the orbit where it is, then you come up with a plan, you fire the thrusters, and you this goes on for the for 15 years or so. Similarly, for the in the north-south direction, uh, as you may re, uh, some of you may realize, the Earth's ax, you know Earth's axis, the Earth's equatorial plane is slanted in respect to the ecliptic plane, which is the plane along which the Earth moves around the sun. So, and same thing with the uh, with the uh, moon, which is also, you know, displaced. So if you're at the satellite, you are being pulled by these two bodies along this direction. And so what that means is you are continuously being steered off the equatorial plane. And so uh, approximately every four weeks or so, you have to fire the north face thrusters to make the correction and bring it back to this plane here. So as I had mentioned earlier, we calculate over 15 years how much correction we'll need. Based on that, we design the propellant tank, we put the propellant in there, and we, uh, we uh, have to fire thrusters on a regular basis to keep it within, to maintain its orbit. And once that is over, the propellant is, you run out of that, that's the end of your propellant life. And now, the important thing, and this is the, both IT, ITU and FCC rule, which is you are not allowed or you're not supposed to use up all the propellant. You have to if you remember that once you have lost control, your satellite is drifting and moving and it's uh, not only is there a collision risk, but you are going to get in front of other satellites and you are going to create havoc as far as interference and all that. So because of that, the requirement is a deorbit. And what that means is we have to raise the orbit of the satellite by at least 200 kilometers above the geos, you know. So once it's there, then, uh, then it'll stay there. And also just for reference, uh, satellites that are in geo orbit, they're so high, it'll never come down. It'll be there forever. So that's the reason why it's important to do that and to, you know, to not uh, create hazard for other satellites uh, and just, uh, go back to the lower Earth orbits. Those orbits, because even at 100 kilometers uh, altitude, there's still some atmosphere. 
So eventually they all decay. Once those orbits also need to be maintained, but um, uh, you know, but once you run out of propellant, then slowly that orbit will decay and eventually it will burn out. So for low Earth orbits, it's not an issue, but for geos, we have to uh, make sure that we do deorbit properly. Otherwise, uh, you know, this, you're going to create a lot of problems. And finally, I just want to finish off by nominally, like, like you know, like cell phone, you know, cellular networks and satellites and everything has its usage. And, you know, there's something that's appropriate for one and, you know, not appropriate for the other. So, for example, a satellite can give you much bigger coverage. You know, as we said, it, you can cover a third of the Earth by one satellite. So this is a much, much bigger area than, uh, you know, a tra terrestrial network. And therefore, ideally, if you have a big, big landmass that you want to cover, that are the way to go. And in fact, um, uh, think that take the case of Indonesia. Indonesia has been an early entrant into use of satellites for communication. And you can see why they have, I, I believe over a thousand islands, you know, in, in, in the small ones. And so since the late sixties, they have been very fast to use satellite communication because it's so much easy to uh, set up networks, uh, you know, using that. Uh, Infrastructure building, this is what I just said, that if there are no, uh, this is the second part, which is if you have areas, you are talk about Ethiopia, or if you're talking about Somalia or others where you don't have you know, existing structures or existing uh, um, infrastructure or, you know, in that case to build up something very quickly, satellite would be the fast, fastest way to go there because you just put up a VSAT network quickly and you can link different cities and different towns and all that. You know, on the other hand, if you have a small area where you already have a good mobile network, then the utility or the additional benefit that satellite communication satellite is providing you uh, does go down substantially. So it, then it comes down to cost, you know, and uh, I think uh, uh, so it comes down to the economy of, you know, economics of using that. Uh, but you still have other uses. A lot of times you have some additional, uh, you need some additional bandwidth right away, then it's easier to set up with, with uh, satellites and set up some temporary thing, including say disaster management, news gathering we talked about. Suppose there's a huge flood and cyclone and everything falls apart. You can take your uh, satellite trucks over there and you know, set up something very quickly. So, so anyway, and uh, uh, so uh, basically I, I want to finish by saying that all technology have their pluses and minuses. And in some cases, in some situation, one is more suitable than the other. And so that's, that's how uh, you decide whether you want or you should have a satellite or not. And so I think with that, my talk ends. So please ask any questions you have. Excellent, thank you so much. This was really very high quality presentation. Uh, maybe I'm biased a little bit, but that's okay <laughs> because I have interest in this area, but it was really informative for all of us. I hope you all enjoyed it. So are you going to share these slides for us, with us? I, I've given it uh, the copies to Anispai, so if you want to. Okay, uh, yes, thank you so much. Yeah, we, we will put it uh, on the RBR channel and we'll share the link. Yes. Hey, uh, Shabir, I got a question for you. You know, you see that diurnal variation yeah. of the uh, gravitational uh, effect. No, gravitational is a diurnal. Gravitation is one track. The diurnal is because of solar pressure that causes the eccentricity, that causes the circle to become ellipse, basically. Think about it. I see. So, so essentially the movement is radial or is it... Uh, no, longitude. Yeah, the radial long component is there, but, but that, is, uh, that is also... So normally when you do a station keeping, you have to look at everything and take care of. But the visible one is the radial is going in and out from you, right? So you yeah. don't need as much. But, but there is, you know, there are two movements can occur, a meridional movement and a sagittal movement. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The yeah, yeah. Aerial and the meridional is the polar. So which way are, are these? Are the the north-south, remember I showed the, the north-south? I, I did not show a plot of that. Uh, the, the solar lunar thing, that is what causes you, causes your 
plane to change, and that is what gives you the uh, okay. north-south movement. Gotcha. Okay. And the eastward movements are primarily from eccentricity, the change in eccentricity, and the Earth's you know gravitational harmonics that pulls you one way or another. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm worried about. What I'm, I'm thinking about because you know normally you are radially you are fixed in space with respect to the earth center, correct? But not quite. I mean, yes. I mean, okay. if you can I'm maintain of point, of course, the earth yeah. center itself is sort of rotating. Okay. Yeah. So there is a little bit of I can understand that. Now, if you can maintain zero degree inclination, zero zero eccentricity, and exactly four to one, six four point whatever the number is, then okay. you'll be exactly fixed. But normally, that's not what we mean. Normally, we say 100 degrees or 5 degrees plus minus 0 0.05. That's your box. You okay, but it, it comes back to its original position and then goes out of position. So this is a periodic kind of... Yeah, you keep, you keep on correcting it. Yeah, you keep so, on keep correcting it. You have to keep on correcting it? or does Yeah, it yeah. No, no. You keep on correcting it. No, because otherwise it'll keep on increasing. I mean, you see the, uh, the up and down? I saw, I saw, yeah. I saw yeah. Initially, it's small. You don't have to do anything. But what will happen is eventually it'll hit the box, the yep. 0 0.05, and then you'll have to correct it. Okay. Thanks. I have I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one you already answered because now I know that the space is a hazard now. A lot of traffic jam. So you do orbit that thing that is fine. So that after 15 years, life is gone. So you launch another uh, satellite on the same slot allocated to you. It it depends on what your condition with ITU is. Yeah, a lot of people do that. Uh, normally what happens is if you're using the same frequency, you remember that, mm -hmm. if you're using the same frequency and similar power and all that, then when you reapply, your chances of, uh, you know, of getting that is much higher because the frequency coordination and everything has already been done. You're using it. So it's much easier to get the same slot. So uh, uh, as Bangladesh, Bangabundu satellite is using, uh, which one? Sputnik? Uh, the, the, the Orbit, right? So, yeah. 119.5 or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, we are paying money. So after. No, you have already paid that. Huh? You have for paid them slot? 30 million for that slot already. Yeah. That that is I'm talking about. That it is only for 15 years. Yeah. Environmental <laughs> question. Uh, satellite. Ultimately, the space garbage one of right. the end of life, geo-habitation, or our own This is what I've been talking about geo. The, the issue you're talking about is Leo. That's a real problem. Say it again, please. Uh, the this is for the geostationary orbit. This is the 20,000 miles up orbit. Uh -huh. The real junk is in the low Earth orbit, which uh -huh. is anywhere, you know, 300 to 500, 600 miles. Uh -huh. That is full of junk. The, what, what happens is eventually it does come down and uh, it enters the atmosphere and burns up, but it does take time. So in the meantime, it's really a problem. In fact, every time uh, for, for manned missions, this is a real, real concern uh, oh. that, you know, on the, on the my way real, up. My real question is, is there any international effort to clean the atmosphere or do something so that uh, the garbage do not create a real hazard in the future? I have, I have seen, in fact, one of my friends also, they have submitted uh, SBIR, the Small Business Innovation Research Proposal, on using such nets and so on. So there are a lot of talks, nothing has been implemented, but this is something that is, uh, that is very real. The, the, <coughs> and uh, it sooner or later, it has to be given attention. Otherwise, every time you launch something, you, are, you run the risk of being, you know, hitting uh, one of the debris and causing, and especially if it's a manned mission, you, you, it's, a, it's a real hazard to human lives. Yeah, we must think about it because uh, you see the ocean garbage now. There I know, I know. <laughs> organizations, international organizations, they are trying to clean the ocean. Uh, so maybe not in our lifetime, but in our uh, you know next generation's lifetime, the 
um, space garbage will be a problem mm -hmm. yeah yeah no actually there are there are dozens and dozens of papers every year that talk about space uh, debris and all that so no it is it is getting a lot of attention it's just that i don't think they still have a solution a practical solution or implementable solution to cleaning that up and i think that's but a lot of people are thinking about that because this is a real real hazard yeah Shabitwe, I have a question. A few years ago, the <clears throat> DOD was talking about a nanosatellites where they would uh, launch a constellation of nanosatellites that will work in, in tandem as opposed to a bigger one. Uh, can you educate us a little bit? Oh, that? yeah, yeah. That's, that's a subject. In fact, if you want, at some point, I can also talk about, about that. Yeah, so no normally what happens, and uh, I don't know how much time I want to take, but... Uh, Typically, satellites are expensive. And so there has been, in recent years, I would say about the last five years or so, uh, attention to the small satellites. And we are talking about uh, something called CubeSats. CubeSats are basically 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch cubes within that. So, and they go by uh, 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 dimension, they're called, one U means it's just one cube. The, the cube satellites, one cube was started, that's almost useless. You can put a transmitter in there and just throw it out. But right now, there's a lot of six U's. Basically, you put six of them together at even 12 U's, uh, 12 of them together, where you can actually have uh, good signs, um, you know, and that has become very uh, promising. In fact, to give an idea, for example, NASA, NASA, say Goddard, they have uh, every year, they probably give out one or two, two uh, satellite um, uh, uh, contracts or launches uh, for say for Earth observation or something like that. Each of those satellites cost you about $250, $300 million. Now think of how many PIs, the principal investigators, they send their proposal for every one of those opportunities. Uh, literally, you know, there'd be over hundred and one gets the chance. So what happens to the other 99? They have to keep waiting. And so that became, you know, so lately what they're saying is, look, we need to do something about it. So even though for a CubeSat or for a NanoSat or a SmallSat, you're not going to get all the things that all the tests or experiments you wanted to do, but at least it's not, it's not zero versus hundred, you know, you still get something. And so that has, in fact, NASA Goddard has now uh, opened the, uh, uh, a, a nanosat or small sat program office uh, at, um, at Wallops Island, uh, Virginia. And they're looking at it very, very uh, closely. And in fact, as an aside, remember, uh, uh, as I talked about our company, uh, Astracom, we are actually targeting our uh, solutions primarily for this nanosats, uh, primarily because this have very limited power, very limited uh, space, very, you know, so on. Uh, and so they need much more efficient uh, way of sending data back than what's currently out there. So we feel that this is an opportunity. So in fact, our company's target is what you're talking about, the nanosat and uh, small sat. Uh, the, the right now, uh, it can cost you anywhere from uh, the smallest ones. I'm talking about the, you know, how high school, the, the very good high schools have them. Uh, you can spend about $10,000 and you can have a small CubeSat ready to go, but launching it costs you $100,000. So that is the biggest deterrent. So typically what happens is NASA and others, they offer schools and colleges free ride. I mean, when they launch something, there's some leftover uh, um, weight that they can launch. So they would offer you know, uh, colleges and, you know, and schools and so on. Uh, the opportunity for free launch in there. But uh, right now, it's the launch cost that's getting in the way of the you know widespread use of uh, nano satellites. Shabir, uh, I have uh, uh, a couple of uh, questions for you. One of them is, you know, what has happened to the EDDM satellites? You know, are they going down or are they? No, no, EDDM, yeah. So EDDM is a very interesting uh, thing. Uh, the same question actually over that. <laughs> okay, so Iridium was started by Motorola uh, many years ago. 
they, they 96, spent, 98, I guess. Yeah, they, they spent several billion dollars. And by the time, and, and it took a long time to, you know, come to fruition. By the time it got started, the cell phone, cell phone technology had really taken off and their market was gone. And so they declared bankruptcy. And then, but somebody else bought the Iridium system for, I think, $50 million or so. So they made a lot of money because at $50 million, even though with the limited use uh, customer base, it still is profitable. Uh, spending a couple of billion dollars, it's not, you know, it, it's not sustainable. So Iridium is still going on. It's a limited service. It, they, they cover areas primarily over the poles and over the oceans where you do not have uh, cell towers. And so they provide the marit maritime uh, service. And, you know, so th these are essentially uh, very, very um, limited use uh, areas, but there's enough business in there. In fact, they even ordered their second generation that, which, are, which, are have, which are being launched right now, actually. So it, it is there. But as I said, I mean, you, you know, it, it was not a sustainable model if you had to spend, you know, a couple of billion dollars, but uh, it's more sustainable at the lower cost. So, so Shabiba, it's like, oh. yeah. uh, um, the second question was, the, with, the, um, with the SpaceX, you know, the usable satellites, uh, sorry, rockets, mm -hmm. is, the, is the unit cost going down per launch? Uh, that's what yeah. they, they're hoping to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what, that's... you know, but in fact, SpaceX, when they started, they, they started at this lower end and actually it was pretty good because uh, what happened for the longest time, Ariane was the way to go. And uh, uh, I was at Orbital at the time and we were building the small satellites and launch cost was costing more than the satellite itself. And so when SpaceX came, came about with uh, Falcon F9, I think we uh, Orbital satellites were probably one of the first ones that, because all of a sudden they're offering $60 million launches and so on. So, uh, I, and with the reusable one, I think it should be, uh, it, it, it should bring the cost down. Uh, I, have, uh, I, have I have a question. Yeah. So, um, Aptito, you know, you spoke about Leo satellites. Uh, satellites. Can you shed some light on SpaceX Starlink satellite constellation that they're planning? Oh yeah, in fact, in fact, you know, I'm talking about I'm being my centric, me centric, but the Starlink is one of our main targets actually for our yeah. So Starlink, uh, so here's the thing. Uh, one of the uh, issues people have looked about is can we do good internet, uh, you know, pro using satellite geo. Intelsat used it, uh, tried it long time ago, uh, with 22,000 miles radi you know, orbit the delay and all that is too much. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it was, it never took off. People, you know, customer, customer um, base never grew. And, you know, so the, the next thing is then, can we uh, do something else? And that's how this, uh, not only into Starlink, but there was a company called OneWeb, which unfortunately yeah. went into bankruptcy because of COVID. But in fact, OneWeb was ahead of Starlink. And the idea is have, uh, you know, uh, Starlink has about, target is 4,000 satellites. OneWeb had about 1,900 and some satellites. And the idea is to essentially have a ring of the small satellites, maybe about uh, 300 miles up. And so if you're that, you know, then your, um, the latency, the data delay and all that, that really goes down. But now what's happening is your satellites are zooming past you. So you have to have a very intricate and way of transferring your path from one satellite, it'll to send the other to, one to the other one, and you know, so this switching, switching between satellites yeah. and all that. So those technologies, they have, you know, there, there's been a lot of development in there, but that is what is enabling, uh, you know, Starlink and all that. But we unfortunately yeah, Starlink actually has gone beta up in the northern region, uh -huh. and they're basically pushing out 150 Mbps downlink and 50 mbps uplink at less than 50 milliseconds today okay yeah so what you know so we are hoping that we can raise that if we are successful in what we are trying to do raise the 50 uh, you know the downlink rate to you know almost double of what we have what they have but, but, yeah, but right now i mean this is in beta they actually are promising like one gigabyte gigabit you know coming down yeah 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 
Yeah, but so, that's what that's what one woman's pro promising too. It's just that they they had, they had to fold to you know. Well, the problem with one web was they never had a launching program, right? No, they yeah, exactly, they never exactly. Focused on think, entire logistics. Yeah, yeah. I I think you have caught it right there. I think uh, yeah. uh, and the SpaceX. Other part is with these Leos, both one web and Starlink. There is an earthbound fiber backbone that can be utilized as a backplane, which I think Starlink is the first one who's doing it. So mm -hmm. that's why. It's an interesting uh, method. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's very, very innovative. I want to see. Uh, in the end, it comes down to the economy. Of, you see that that that's what either you survive or you fail. But yeah, from, but you know these subscriptions, they're doing it for only ninety nine dollars. That sounds very good, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. It's going to be. It's going to disturb the whole. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is. I'm kind it. of. I come, I'm kind of sad that um, you know one web went down because uh, I mean it would have been nice to have some competition and see what comes out. Yes. I have one question now. Can I ask? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, it is it pertains to both design and uh, costing. Uh, say, for example, when you design the satellite and uh, uh, launch it, say for Bongo Bongo satellite, it has. If I like to add other countries there, should you redesign that thing? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, design, it, it, or it, you can do it from uh, your Earth later. Number no, you, you cannot. You cannot. I mean, the, the technology that we're talking about. I mean, in the future, they are talking about the. You know, the, there are different technologies now, but that's still in the R and D phase uh, where you can uh, dynamic. You know, so. On. But right now, the coverage is uh, the the antenna that you see that's sticking out. Right. There is a, a kind of deviation. If, if you were, if you ever visit a some center and look at the plane closely, you'll find that it's been formed. In a certain way, to give you that particular shape of the uh, of the footprint. So, so Bangladesh cannot uh, uh, Bangabandhu satellite cannot get any client uh, of the nearby countries to provide. Unlikely, them. unlikely, because again, it's competition. I mean, in the, you see, is in Indonesia, right? Indonesia has been providing their own. They, they have, I would say, about right now about 20 satellites between Indostar and Telecom and all that. They've been in satellite business for the last, uh, since the uh, 70s, you know, for the last 40, 50 years. So they know what they're doing. They have experience and all that. So given that, uh, you know, l let me ask you in a different way. You, you, you want to go to a bank, you have Bank of America, you have this, you have this. And then I open up a bank with some people who have no background, who have, you know, two months of training somewhere. Uh, where would you go? No, th that I understand. But question is that since the designer of these satellites are the expert people. Oh without... yeah, so I don't want to get yeah. into that. But I mean, that... Not, I don't. I think Shabir, what Shabir Bhai is trying to say is it's not just the design here. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like an address space. I think he addressed it early on that. Uh, with these geo satellites, you need to have kind of like the rights in space to broadcast to certain regions on Earth, uh, and every nation has their own, how should I say, um, uh, licensing or permitting. So, for example, no, 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 no Zaman, it is not. Uh, I, I heard, I carefully listened to what he told. No, I, I, when you are la you are using a satellite, it is going with a angular shape and it covers big area. About that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you can, you can point it. be covered by that. Yeah. So what Zaman is saying, I, I I'm not sure about that legality. But basically, what he's saying is, would you need permission to use? So, so, let's let's uh, flip it. You know how Bangladesh uh, uh, Bangladesh satellite users used to use, are, are some of them are probably still using uh, satellite like AsiaSat and others. Uh, so I do not know whether to use that, you had to take the permission of the government to say, I'm using agents that is Hong Kong based, uh, you know, or uh, Singtel is, is, there's some, you know, so Singapore all this country, Singapore is Singapore based. So for example, uh, I do not know, you know, maybe every country has their own rules. And so uh, whether, just because you have beam over the country, uh, does it give you right, you know, can people use it? I answer, I really don't know. Those are regulatory uh, rules pertaining to the country itself, and I don't think ITU or FCC has any such rules covering those. Those are, you know, can you know, I can I make a comment on that one? Uh -huh. so 
this these satellite signals are not like your tv station uh, uh -huh. radiations uh -huh. these right. are encoded signals oh yeah yeah, yeah. they use right. that signal you need to purchase or license the company's decoder oh absolutely yeah absolutely. so even though it covers the half of the or 40% of the earth you are not free to use it you no, have no, to pay my, for it to use yeah it. you are right you are right my question is that bangladesh spend lot of money if they get some client more client to sell oh, I, 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 agree, like, I agree that is what i was yeah, asking. that's that's true harish bhai but the, here is the problem india will not be bangladeshi client exactly. because they have no india will not you, you see that yeah, i have the okay. i have the thing uh, up here indonesia will not either will not either so, right sri lanka yeah. so only nepal I uh -huh. think they have already signed that agreement with Nepal because they don't have their own satellite. Right. So only a smaller. We are in this market or in this business quite late. Late. Yeah. So oh. in my opinion, we need to look into our own use. How can we use it more efficiently, Expanding. more intelligently for Bangladesh purposes only? And if you can show some new market areas, new applications, then we can sell it to somebody else because they may not have it. Yeah. So we have to develop that. Yeah, but remember what I said. In order to use it, you have to invest in yes. ground networks, and you know, so anywhere from tens, twenty million, hundred million right. or so. So yeah. unless you know that you're going to make profit, unless you know you're going to make profit, would you invest yeah. the money? That's that's one of the reasons yeah. so, why I do I do strongly believe that up to this point, Bangladesh satellite whole project and everything is uh, outside country based. Or we are just a simple no, no, pure it's a, it's customer. A, it's a prestige project. It's a prestige. Yeah, project. exactly, it's prestige it's project. It's a but prestige. I think it's time that we go into this business not as a prestige project, as a technology development mentality. Yeah. That we develop our own technology, we develop our own manpower, and we right. invest in it. Not a mega bucks, but a small scale, and slowly build up the back. A bone of this space technology. The reason why I am very much interested in this is space used to be a defense industry. It, it is, is slowly morphing into a commercial industry, no, and we need to take advantage both. of that. <laughs> it's both. I have a quick no, question. Absolutely. So that brings a question, if I may, please. Uh, that what are the main roadblocks in Bangladesh that they have to overcome to get full benefit of this Bangabandhu satellite? Competition. You already have cellular network, so. So, you know, so is satellite bringing you anything more and at a cheaper rate? If the answer is no, then you are out of luck. I mean, that's the problem. But I think you know what yeah. you guys are forgetting that there are other usages, weather forecasting, have you know help to farmers, you know no, regarding no. you know where they no, the no, not from geo orbit, that's the, no, not from geo orbit, right? yeah, that's not from geo orbit. So. So, you know, one of the key things that's missing out in this uh, kind of like Bangabundu satellite is we don't have a very good, how should I say, eyes or camera capabilities. Okay. You can't. From so, 30,000 miles, you can't. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, will be Leo satellite. That has to be Leo uh, satellites. Zaman Shah, that has to be a Leo satellite, not those uh, yeah. geo satellites. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Shabid, no. What I, no. What do you, about weather, weather forecasting? Is that no, whether is, I mean there are some the arc, uh, is the arc of observation so small from twenty thousand miles that you cannot yeah do yeah that? I mean from no it depends on what you want to see like NOAA cool. satellite has a couple of the geo but they're yeah, looking at the whole saw. globe some they're of the NOAA satellites are in geostationary orbits they're yeah. looking at the whole yes. globe yes but you yeah. as a Bangladesh I mean how does it help you by looking at the whole globe you're you want to see micro level you want to see what yeah. what's happening in Bogora and you know in Rajshahi yes. right. I don't mean that I mean in terms of crop Crop use and no, so even, on. Same, like same for thing. example, forecasting, you know, no, when too, the monsoon is coming, etc. It's too yeah. small. I mean, just do the geometry yourself. Yeah. You're twenty thousand miles away, and you're, you know, how, 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 what is the total length? Yeah, even one degree will cover a large yeah. area. Yeah, yep. yeah. So yeah. you know, you can't. So your cameras or your sensors. I mean, there is a limit to how. Yeah. Know, yeah. Are are to talk talk the in the marketplace, is can there? I, Third party middleman who can bring the client before you launch any satellite. Okay, okay let, that's a good question. Let me let me rephrase it in a different way. Normally, I mean, I was in as I said, I was in SpaceNet. We had a fleet of ten satellites or so. Before we launch, as we buy, decide to buy a satellite, what we do is, you know, how we used to have the malls uh, where rectangular, you have the Sears, J.C. Penney, right. mm -hmm. you know, and some maybe by Lauren Taylor and so on. Before a mall 
is started, people start money, they get commitment from, these are called anchor stores. Right. They com get commitment from at least two, if not three anchor stores before right. they proceed. Absolutely. When we launch satellite, and I'm talking about my space, space, right. space net days. Suppose we had 30 satellites. We would not launch unless, until we had already MOU uh, understanding of, um, I would say about 30, 40% of the capacity. We have that commitment even before we launch. That's when we launch that, right? Bangladesh satellite, unfortunately, as you know, is I, I, unfortunate. I, I no, shouldn't say that. It. It's, it's top down. The decision was taken. We will launch satellite. Yes, got so it. Now you build a business case, which really, I mean, that's just what. I mean, it is not a business case. It's not a business case. Just wish yeah, list, whatever, whatever you like writing one. you put in there. I got, but but is, that is what I was asking. Did we, uh, when they designed that Bangabandhu satellite, did they put those peripheral things there that? I have in no the idea. future, if any client like to come, we can hook it up with them. That is what. No, I, I think the areas that are covered, if the if the rule licensing and regulations don't get in the way, yes, if somebody in in you know in the they can um, they can be added, right? Yeah, if they want is to, they can any call third party or a middleman. They can bring some client to. Buy no, but he, here's the problem, and uh, we, which is actually I should have covered at some point. Right. The C band, this is called FSS, fixed satellite services. Uh -huh. That market worldwide. Is okay. has gone down so much. In fact, you know, Intelsat, it has been a near bankruptcy for the last few years because this has been a disaster. So, regardless of, you know, it's a bad time to buy this satellite, regardless of who you are, you know, whether it's Bangladesh or not, you know. So it it, it just so to answer your question, normally yes, there you know, uh, but at this time. Uh, I think I think we might be out of luck because remember I was telling about you know this um, a dozen Indonesian satellites and um, Malaysia Mia said they have about six of them uh, Thaicom Thailand has about uh, one two three four of them you know uh, I bet they're all underutilized all of them are yeah. losing money. Got well, it. I have I have you know just just it's a query you know because it's not my area, which is that. In terms of, I mean, I mean, how much bandwidth is left over uh, for for the Bangladesh satellite right now, so that it. they could drop all of it. <laughs> then, They're using the two the two high power thing for so if you're in you can buy those dishes and uh, you know you can get the uh, TV channels. I think all the all the Bangladesh they, they have made them go through that, okay. uh, and uh, basically the two channels, the high power ones were licensed to Beximco and I think Bengal Group or somebody early on, even before the business plan was finished. I think, somebody, I think somebody, somebody, somebody leaked, the, leaked the thing and uh, the minister at the time was Inu or somebody and he gave it to his friends right away. So, you know, so <laughs> all. No, but time, in case of time and the bandwidth and time, you know, so, you know, you're, you're just, we're going to waste. It so is waste. I mean, you have already spent three three years. I mean, yeah. I do not know the details, but I, I'd be very yes, I'm gone. made yeah. any money. Twelve more years and I'm gone. So, yeah, three years. Like out of fifteen years, you have spent three years. Yeah. And, and and what that here's the interesting part. You know that uh, since the business plan says seven years, that is being taken as a bible. So when you talk to the minister and everybody else, they'll they'll keep on talking about, oh yeah, it will break even. You know. So now the la last one, they, what they did was, uh, first two years they had zero income. So this gentleman just added the seven years and now he's saying we'll break even in nine years. So he's just adding to the yeah. magic number seven and whatever years go by that you haven't done anything, you just add to that and you say, I'll break even, you know, and I keep on trying to explain that you'll break even when you have enough paying customers who pay you enough revenue to break even. Yes. That number has nothing to do with the, yeah. the time. The, Chronological time has nothing to do with breaking even. It's it's the revenue you're, you're gathering. Well, I, I think the I only think we way, should yeah. I think we should invite Shahjan Mahmud Bhai. No, he was invited. <laughs> I, right? I agree absolutely. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I, I did have... I did talk to I did uh, visit him few times about uh -huh. these things and stuff like oh, that. Would you like to take months? the initiative, uh, Nazmul Bhai? I have already sent him an invitation informally, but we can send a formal uh, invitation. No, I, so I, why I, don't you? No, here, let, let, let me put it this way. When they're building, I did I did offer my, uh, you know, support and all that and all that. Uh, so, you know, they, then, you know, he, 
he, in fact, he called me once and sent me a resume and all that, and they never bothered. So the reason I'm not uh, that interested is because they really are not serious. They are just looking for another tender opportunity. They're looking for, that, that's basically it. So we are, you know, we are wasting our time. <clears throat> Probably we can hear from them in March, April timeframe, you know. Yes. I I think that would be a very useful thing. Uh, why don't you send another formal invitation okay. from ALU we'll to Shajan Bhai? No, no, at, so, least, you know, at least we can get something, how many clients they have, what is their business plan, how to recover the cost. Those things, I believe they could have answered. No, but, but here, here's the problem I, I, I have seen. And the thing is, do you want to be impolite? I mean, the thing is, when they say things, especially technical, it's, it's all wrong. I mean, in fact, no, I no, had no, a... Is, I, uh, so, so when so they say I, something... Do I, I have just... a suggestion, Sabir Bhai? Yeah. The thing is, you know, and, and as all the respected, uh, you know, elder brothers, you know, in, I know we were supposed to have the 20, uh, 2020, you know, the biannual stuff. Why yeah. can we not have the biannual stuff and host it online? You know, uh, even uh, if you plan. Kazi, now, let I... me update you on that. Actually, yeah. the uh, the Silicon Valley chapter is organizing that meeting. It's on the way. It's supposed right. to be in March, I suppose. Right. So, yes, in March. Yes. Yeah. So they they are taking initiative on that because it's, it's their turn of the biennial meeting. The next one will be in DC. So yeah, we have a lot of opportunities coming up actually. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, ask Jangi to uh, um, accommodate this satellite thing there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It Someone can it ask it them, is, ask him to do that. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, we should have a track on this thing. Right. right because right, right. Bangladesh is getting into this thing, and we need to know all of us as an engineer. Oh, Maybe uh, Nazmul somebody... Bhai should take the initiative on that. So, He's on the committee. Presentation to this uh, 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 forum will be in January, uh, February, right? As you said. Which one? March. March. Oh man, we did it faster so that we can uh, gear it up for the uh, convention, a uh, biennial convention, to put it a slot there. So yeah. Anis Bhai, can you just send an email to Jahangir the one? Uh, I will do that. that. We we had this seminar, and here it was kind of uh, su suggested okay. that we should have a track and space related and satellite related issues. Absolutely, right. I'll do that. Okay. I will call Zahangi to accommodate that. Yeah. <laughs> sure, that would be nice. So, anyone has any other question? Please feel free to ask. Oh, by the way, I was talking to the Indonesian satellite company's board member about four weeks ago. Which one? Uh, the Indonesian's yep. government. No, there are two. There's a telecom. There's an Indostar. Do you remember which one? No, this this is the uh, regulatory board. Of oh, Indonesia. I see. I see. I see. Okay, yeah. okay. 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 So what I was told is they're getting out of the satellite business, which was surprising. Remember what I was saying about the bad market? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, <clears throat> just in FYI, because it, we had been talking about Indonesia, so I wanted to just. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and there, there are two things here. One is the bad market, but the bad market is because the infrastructure of the cables and the uh, s mobile and the cellular network that has really taken off. And with the 5G, it's, it's going to be even, you know, even faster and all that. So you'll see less and less dependence on satellite communication. So satellite providers, you know, they are looking at newer, newer markets and all that. So it's, a, it's, it's going to be a very different world than uh, what we had. And so if you're sitting like Bangladesh is with that satellite, he, I think you were- I'm going to go on the record and say even 5G is going to get a kick from Starlink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they want to use that. Absolutely, absolutely. No, but remember, it's a totally different different thing. I mean, it's not, yes. yeah, yeah. It's, it's not the geo FSS that we are, we you know, Bangamundu one yeah. and all that is. So, so I, I think, uh, yeah, unfortunately the timing and everything, I think, uh, the Bangabundi one might be out of luck uh, as far yeah. as uh, being financially even close to breaking. Right? I, I'm not saying it'll break even. It won't even get close to it, I suspect. Shambhi uh, Bhai, I do not want to sound like a devil's advocate, but al allow me to ask this. See, all entrepreneurs always come up with the smart ideas that, okay, there was no opportunity there, and okay, now they came up with something, uh, you know, is, is there anything that you or anyone else can suggest to Bangladesh, uh, the satellite folks, that how they can find some, you know, 
There's two points here. Two, two points here. I think we could, and in fact, we have talked to some people, but they really are not interested. That, that is the thing that frustrated him the most. That's why I don't uh, particularly, uh, <clears throat> I'm not interested in, you know, I'm, I'd like to hear what they have to say, but uh, I've spent enough time there um, uh, and uh, there really is no serious interest. So I think we are wasting You, you also submitted a proposal, I believe, right? Oh yeah, no, I, I took orbital long, but the thing is, it, that doesn't matter. I mean, that that is the first no, time I that's, saw. That's my, question is that, <laughs> my question is that the government money, taxpayers' money, they should think about before they choose a company, whether the they yeah, I, market research, whether they are bringing any clients, uh, even uh, before launching that thing, that was mm -hmm. not done. Mm -hmm. No, no, that was not done. Uh, let let me give you a very good example, and that's the reason why I'm I feel that they're not serious. Like when we, uh, when I again at SpaceNet, when we when we used to launch a satellite at the launch site, the president of our company, who would he invite? Uh, you'd have the chairman of CNN or you know prospective and current customers and all that, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> when Bangladesh Mangalmundu satellite was launched. Who should you have invited? Well, if you are covering Indonesia, get your embassy to find out who the big players are in communications. Yeah. Invite their, if, even if they're not your customer, the goodwill, the come and you know, sp you know, uh, uh, spend it, you know, the party or what, whatever, and yeah. so on too. Uh, and you know, but you know, none of the guess who the thing was full of. You know, it was all the point. They had hundreds and hundreds of party workers from New York and Bangladesh and all over. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that if you if no, that's no, no. a political thing, but you're missing the such an important marketing opportunity, you know, and, and that's why I keep on repeating that they really are not serious. That's an afterthought. It's a prestige project. And then if you can do something about it, well and good, but no, you know. Their, their uh, intention was to put a uh, launch a satellite, Bongo Bondu. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I, I, I mean, again, a lot of people will say that's fine. I mean, people, yeah, yeah, yeah. countries do spend, right. you know, hundreds of millions right. of dollars for this yeah. statue and so on, so on. I, mean, they, so, they, they, I don't want to get into that, but I'm just saying yeah. that that's the reality. My question is not there. My question was, if I had some other clients, in the future also we could have done better way also doing it. Becoming oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that, yeah. that is what I... That is why I was asking. That is why I was asking, is there any company, third party can bring some client to Bangabandhu satellite so that Bangladesh can get some revenue? Uh, mm -hmm. Current current circumstances, I mean, we did try to do that, uh, try to help out, but they were not interested. So, I mean, I'm not saying that we would be, have been successful. Who are not but... interested? Bangladesh government? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or, or uh, I think... <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. Yeah, again... They, they...